I feel like every now and then a series comes along that really resonates with you. It takes ideas from things that you've seen numerous times before and manages to make them feel new again. For me, that series is My Hero Academia. But let's take a step back for a second. I first came across this series after Bleach came to a rather underwhelming end, leaving me with a shonen sized hole in my heart. I was in need of a new, hopefully less frustrating series to fill it. Baruto didn't interest me since I wasn't really a big fan of the original series. Hunter x Hunter seemed to be in a constant state of hiatus, and One Piece's artwork always kinda turned me off. I'm not saying it's bad or anything, I'm just not a big fan of it, don't kill me. I decided to give My Hero Academy a look since it seemed to be gaining traction at the time, and I was quite fond of the art style. Its first season had just ended and was receiving glowing reviews, so I figured that was the perfect opportunity to jump into the series. While I did enjoy watching the 13 episodes of the first season, it was the manga chapters that came afterwards that truly transformed me from watching an episode every now and then to spending hours looking for a decent Deku figure online. Oh, come on, don't they have one of his new outfit yet? But what is it exactly that makes this series such a breath of fresh air in an increasingly overpopulated genre? On the surface, it looks like your average superhero story with a group of heroes trying to stop an evil organization. It's got lovable characters, a unique art style, and some truly great action. But there's more to it than that. What really elevates this series above the usual fair of shonen works is how it manages to break the mold of what we've come to expect from the genre, and how it skillfully subverts our expectations. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about what makes My Hero Academia truly special, and why even fans outside of the shonen genre will find something to enjoy here. Just a heads up, this video will contain some minor spoilers for characters and their powers, but I will do my best not to spoil any major plot points. Also, I'm going to be making quite a few comparisons between this series and Bleach. While the stories themselves aren't similar, they are both part of the shonen genre and thus borrow similar elements. I want to make clear though, this isn't me trying to single Bleach out or anything, as a lot of the arguments I make can be said of other series of the genre. Bleach is just the one I know best because it's the series I've been the most preoccupied with these past few years. My Hero Academia takes place in a world where almost everyone has some form of superpower, referred to as quirks. Spandex-wearing heroes and villains alike can be seen battling each other on a daily basis. Our story follows a young student named Izuku Midioria, nicknamed Deku, who despite being quirkless, i.e. lacking any superpowers of his own, strives to save others and become a hero himself. After witnessing Deku's resolve with his own eyes, the number one hero at the time, All Might, decides to take the young boy under his wing and pass on to him his super strength quirk one for all. Most arcs of the series involve Deku and his classmates at the prestigious UA High School, fighting villains, and learning what it truly means to be a hero. So let's start off by examining Deku's character. Right off the bat, Deku is given a quirk from the most powerful hero at the time, seemingly giving him a massive advantage over his peers. But what we end up seeing is quite the opposite. Kohai Horikoshi, the creator of the series, has smartly made Deku's new quirk a double-edged sword. While it is indeed powerful, using it at full strength without the proper training can cause irreparable damage to Deku's body. Also, unlike his classmates, Deku has been quirkless his whole life, and thus doesn't understand what it's like to use and manipulate a power of his own. As a result, Deku tends to get beaten. A lot. Even after 151 chapters, Deku hasn't had many winning battles, and the wins he has had have usually come at a great cost to his physical health. In a genre where protagonists seem almost immune to losing, having a main character that's fully capable of being defeated, and doesn't immediately become the most powerful person in the group, is a welcome change of pace. It adds a genuine human element to Deku's character that you don't often see, and helps to make him that much more relatable. Because Deku has almost no battle experience under his belt, he's essentially starting from zero. However, because of Deku's analytical personality, he's able to grasp onto new ideas and techniques very quickly. As a result, every move that Deku uses can be traced back to an earlier encounter, whether it be from his mock battle with Bakugo, his training with Gran Torino, or merely him trying to emulate his mentor's style. It's something that is almost entirely overlooked in the shonen genre. Just look at Bleach, for example. Despite having never wielded a sword before, the moment Ichigo receives his Shinigami powers, he's slashing away at enemies like a pro. Later on, after his Bankai training and in his final battle against Byakuya, we learn that he's also apparently mastered the art of Shunpo, which I guess he must have learned from Yoroichi in just like a few hours? 
But weren't they suggesting earlier that this was like an incredibly difficult move to master? How the hell did he do it so quickly? It isn't unusual for protagonists in Shonen to make massive strides in a short time with seemingly no explanation. Hell, it's almost become a staple of the genre by this point. So for My Hero Academia to visibly show the path Deku takes to learning each of his techniques, as opposed to them just popping up out of thin air, is another great example of how this series breaks the genre's mold. Deku's classmates and teachers at the prestigious UA High School make up the majority of his allies. These range from the cool-mannered homeroom teacher, Aizawa, to the bubbly and uplifting Urakaka, Ur Urakaka, I think I'm never saying that right, and the straight-arrowed class rep, Aida. While these characters all have their funny quirks and make them likable in their own way, what really makes them stand out is how truly human they feel. After watching enough of any specific genre, characters can start to feel like they're just checks off a list of required personality archetypes. The hothead, the sudere, the pervert. However, the UA class continues to surprise me with actions that break away from their individual stereotypes, while at the same time, still feeling in character. The best example for this is Katsuki Bakugo, Deku's childhood friend and long-standing rival. He's such an incredible hothead that at first glance, you would probably take all his yelling and screaming as indicative of a brash character. However, what we see instead is someone who uses that rage to focus his attention towards a goal and reach it. This can be seen during the cavalry battle of the sports festival when Bakugo gets hassled by a class 1B member. Surprisingly, Bakugo's resulting anger doesn't cause him to become more careless or attempt to win a battle on his own like we'd probably expect, but instead fuels his desire to crush his opponents by any means necessary, even if it means relying on the help of his teammates. Similarly, the usual rule-abiding Aida becomes vengeful after his brother is attacked by a villain and puts himself and his friends in danger when he goes after him alone. The ability to have a character break from their archetype without betraying his nature is an incredibly difficult thing for any writer to accomplish. So the fact that Horikoshi has managed to not only succeed at this, but also use these moments to add another layer of depth to his characters is truly astounding. My Hero Academia has some of the most clever superpowers I've ever seen in a hero series. Frog powers, shadow minions, exploding hands, edging legs, sticky ball hair, a literal centipede on a man's body, the list goes on. Even powers that we've seen a hundred times before get a fresh spin here. For instance, Endeavor, the number two hero, actually uses his fire-wielding capabilities as a part of his costume, and even giving himself a fiery stash. How badass is that? But the real magic of these quirks doesn't just come from how they're used, but how they are limited. Shonen manga have always been notorious for making characters overpowered. There tends to be this belief that being more powerful equals being more badass. Tite Kubo, the creator of Bleach, may be the absolute king of this idea. Just look at Sosuke Aizen, or as I like to call him, the Hacks Lord Extraordinaire. Yes, there's no doubt he had some cool moments in Bleach, but I feel like all of that was undermined by just how ridiculously OP he was. He had a genius intellect, he was a master fighter, and he had the ability to fuck with all five of a person's senses. And then what does Kubo decide to do with this unstoppable beast? Oh, he just has him fuse with the Hugyoku and become fucking immortal. Yeah, that's some quality right there, Kubo! <sighs> Sorry, I, I, I've been holding that in for a while. Anyway, the problem with this idea is twofold. One, someone that is so powerful that they have almost no weaknesses leads to an incredibly boring character. Every person has weaknesses of some kind. And when you take that away, it makes it impossible for people to relate to them. And two, it always leads to one inevitable outcome, the bane of every writer's existence, the ass pull. The Webster's Dictionary defines the ass pull as the moment when a writer realizes he's completely written himself into a corner, forcing him to pull out a random and convenient solution from betwixt his butt cheeks. Fortunately, Horikoshi seems fully aware of the pitfalls of having overpowered characters, as even the most powerful of individuals has a very clear weakness. Tokoyami's Dark Shadow, for instance, becomes stronger yet harder to control in darkness, and weaker yet easier to control in light. Todoroki's ice attack will slowly start to freeze his right side, forcing him to use his fire side to balance out the temperature, and Kaminari's lightning abilities can be devastating, but overdoing it short circuits his brain and causes him to start spouting gibberish. However, what makes these weaknesses even more interesting is when it ties directly to a character's nature. Todoroki's struggle with his abusive father caused him to reject his fire powers in favor of the ice power he received from his mother. In doing so, he shortens the time he can wield his ice powers before it freezes his body entirely. Another interesting example is a character that comes much later on by the name of Sir Night Eye. His quirk foresight allows him to see the future of anyone he touches and makes eye contact with. A foresight ability is Rocky Tramp 
for any rider, as it's incredibly easy for it to become abused. Some of you might remember the main baddie from the final arc of Bleach as having a similar technique, which, as it always does, led to the inevitable ass pull. Here though, Night Eye's ability can only be used once every 24 hours, and it can only see a person's future for one hour. While these restrictions do help to limit its capabilities, the real kicker comes from Night Eye's own beliefs. After seeing the future and imminent death of a close friend of his, Night Eye only uses his power when absolutely necessary. You see, according to Night Eye himself, the future he sees always comes to fruition, meaning were he to use it on an ally as a means of tackling a future mission, he may inadvertently witness their own unavoidable death. Just imagining the stress this would cause someone to be powerless to prevent a friend's unfortunate fate, it's no wonder he would limit the use of his ability. This right here is an example of masterful storytelling. Not only does it limit a commonly overpowered ability, but it also adds another layer of depth to Night Eye's character and helps us to sympathize with his plight. What does it mean to be a hero? This is the question My Hero Academia continually presents us as we watch Deku and his friends struggle to find their own answer. However, Horikoshi also poses another equally important question. What does it mean to be a villain? This topic is mainly covered in the story of the main antagonist, Tomura Shigaraki, or as I like to call him, Supreme Facepalm Dono. Shigaraki's growth as a villain acts as a foil to Deku's growth as a hero, as both are being guided by their own mentor down opposing paths. I won't spoil the identity of Shigaraki's mentor for anyone who hasn't seen the series themselves, but let's just say his connections with Deku's mentor, All Might, make for a truly engaging conflict. At the beginning of the series, Shigaraki is probably the least interesting villain. He has no clear goals or motivations aside from simply wanting to destroy everything and kill All Might, and acts like a spoiled brat whenever he fails in his attempts. However, as the plot progresses, Shigaraki begins to undergo a transformation. His mentor calls upon the hero killer Stain, a man so driven by a singular idea that he's willing to go to any and all lengths to see it come to fruition. He wants Stain to act as an example for Shigaraki to show him that a strong conviction is necessary for any good leader. Stain's philosophy, in turn, invites a number of additional allies into the League of Villains, forcing Shigaraki as their leader to start thinking outside of his own well-being. It's at this point that Horikoshi's plan becomes clear. He wanted to give Shigaraki room to grow, just as he did with Deku, so he started him off as the most basic of villains. It's an incredibly fascinating story to watch unfold, as his mentor slowly builds up Shigaraki from a spoiled punk and to a respectable leader that inspires his allies to fight alongside him. It is a risky move, as some fans may choose to leave before getting a glimpse of Shigaraki's full potential, but it is one that will pay off for anyone willing to see the journey through to its conclusion. In a genre where the main baddies tend to act more as final bosses for heroes before being tossed aside, to see such long-term growth in an antagonist is incredibly refreshing. It's a little different from other characters in the genre, such as Vegeta and DBZ or Sasuke from Naruto, because it isn't about their struggle between being good or evil, but instead their desire to become a more capable villain. Shigaraki isn't alone though. In fact, even the most minor of bad guys in the series receive some semblance of characterization, which further demonstrates Horikoshi's commitment to good storytelling. What Horikoshi has managed to do with this series is truly remarkable. It's taken many familiar aspects of the shonen genre and given them a much needed facelift. Honestly, I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what makes My Hero Academia so special. There's so much more I want to talk about in this series, but I think I'm going to stop here before this video gets too bloated. Just a couple of things I want to sound off on, though. This series has to have one of the best anime adaptations I've ever seen. It's so faithful to Horikoshi's amazing art style, not to mention it has a truly bitchin' soundtrack. It's the same studio responsible for other outstanding series such as Space Dandy and Full Metal Alchemist. I really recommend checking it out if you haven't already. That said, if you're already caught up on the anime, do yourself a massive favor and check out the official manga chapters as well. I promise you won't be disappointed. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this little bit of a different video. It's something I've been wanting to make for a while now because I've become such a fan of the series, but I wanted to wait till I had finished one of my Let's Plays so as not to interrupt the usual flow of my videos. If you did, please leave a like and a favorite. It really does help me out. And subscribe if you're not ready to become a Pinky Penguin aboard the SSLP where the days are always sunny and the vids are always funny. Let me know what your thoughts are on the series. I would love to hear your input in the comments down below. Who are your favorite characters in the series? My personal favorites are Bakugo and Nasui. Frog Wafu, best Wafu! Anyway guys, as always, till next time, stay classy.